Hi, welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at two examples of searching an array. So we're currently looking at a small example, um, a little modification of a previous example we saw in the last video, where we have an array called friends uh, declared up here at the top that is initialized to have five values in it. So if you look at the right hand side of the equal sign here, we have a comma delimited list of values. That means that we are not only creating friends, but initializing it with the values to Lisa, John, Arjun, Janet, and Nancy um, to create a five element array. Now this example, we're going to allow the user to type in their name and we will search against our array to see if we can find their name in our list. If we do find it, we're going to indicate they were in the list, and if they are not in the list, we'll also indicate that. So very simple program. But one thing to bear in mind when you're searching an array is it's often common to use what's called a flag. A flag is just a variable that we're using with the intention to indicate whether or not we find a match. So as you can imagine at the beginning of the program, a flag such as this one that we're calling found it would be set to no if it were a string data type or false for a Boolean. Recall that Boolean data types can only be true or false. So we're basically saying create this flag called found it and since we haven't found it yet we'll start it at false. We need a variable uh, to um, reference our index, so we have this integer variable index, as well as a string called name that's going to be used to capture the user's input. And then on line 11, we get started here by asking the user, please enter a name and I will search my friends list. So we read in that name value. So the for loop essentially is going to be used in the same ways uh, that we've used it in the previous examples, except that within the body of the for loop, we're going to be comparing each element of the array to the name the user specified. So the user has typed in their value, we assigned it to name. Then in the loop, uh, again, the loop begins at zero and it goes to the size of the array minus one, remember that's always the correct upper bound because um, this friends.length will give us the size of the array. Regardless of size, this will calculate correctly and minus one will ensure that we subtract one from that value so we don't go outside the bounds of the array because arrays always start at position zero. So that last element is one less than the size of the array. And then uh, that's going to set up our for loop, but in the for loop itself, the interesting part is we're going to compare that name to the current element in our array. So index is zero, first time through, this is going to compare to the name to Talisha. So it's going to say if the name the user typed is equal to Talisha, then set found it to true. So here we see the flag changing from false to true. Now, if, it, if the user had typed um, a different name, um, then we would have not evaluated to true here. And we would have skipped over setting found it to true and we would loop back up around. Index would now be one. And we would compare the name the user had typed to John. And the pattern is going to continue in this manner. Notice if that is not a match, we don't set it to false because we only need to know when we find it. Because if it's found in the list at least once, then we will tell the user we found uh, you're in my friend list. Okay, so this loop essentially searches the array. So after the loop terminates, we know that found it is either going to be true or false. If it was a match with at least one element in the list, found it should be true. So here we say if found it's true, write out you are in my list, else indicate that you are not in my list. So very simple, but you're going to find that pattern used over and over in various examples where we have some sort of flag. It doesn't have to be called found it, it could have a different name. 
but that variable is going to be used to indicate when we have a match. There is a uh, another example. This one's in the book. Um, I believe it's called Mail Order 2, and it was a revisitation of an example we saw last week with pseudocode. And it is a longer example, but the basic premise of it is exactly the same. Um, I'm going to actually start by running this one first so you can see um, what the output looks like. Before I run it, though, one quick note. We have a list of valid items, and this is a... Um, we're supposed to be simulating a website where the user indicates they want to order an item. So we're going to be looking at these item numbers um, when the user types one in to see if we have a match. So I'm going to take a quick look here, 106, 108. Let's sneak over here, put our user hat on, and see what happens if we type something that is a valid item number. So if I type 106, for example, if you look back here, it is indicating the price of 106. 108 was another item that this store sells. So let's see what happens when we type that. Price of 108 is 99 cents. So it's doing some sort of lookup. Now, if I would type an item number that was not in the list, it says item not found. So we get a different type of output. It doesn't look up the price because there is no price for an item that doesn't exist. And finally, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that all of this searching is it itself within a context of a loop. So we have some sort of outer loop, sentinel controlled loop, um, also called an indefinite loop, that is looping indefinitely until the user types 999 to quit. So once we quit, one more piece of information, it's telling us that the user has searched uh, for one invalid item number. So recall that I had typed in, I believe it was 555, it was something that wasn't in the list, this one item had invalid numbers is reflecting that. So there's a lot of things going on with this outer loop that keeps looping while the user hasn't typed 999, but within that, each new item number the user gives us, we're going to use a loop to search through the array of valid items. Okay, so when you look at this list of variables, we have a mixture of variables and constants. Remember, constants start with the const instead of the dim keyword um, that are used in conjunction to basically build that functionality you just saw. I'm going to pull out some of the important pieces um, that really pertain most closely to what we've been looking at with arrays. These two statements declare two arrays, one called valid items, one called valid prices. And notice it does initialize each array to have values in them. So this first one, valid items, is populated with 106, 108, 307, 405, 457, and 688. The valid prices array is an array of doubles. The reason why it's an array of doubles instead of integers, we wanted to be able to store monetary values in it. So as you can see, these floating point values actually correspond to prices. So we have a relationship. Um, this has been set up ahead of time such that uh, there is a relationship. Uh, item 106, for example, cost 59 cents. Item 108 cost 99 cents. So they're related by their position. And the reason why that's important is if you recall, when the user typed in an item number uh, that was in the list, it would look up the corresponding position in the prices array. So if the user typed 106, it said the price is 59 cents. So that's where that's coming from. We have this subscript we're going to be using, um, much like our integer variable um, or x variable in some of our previous examples, uh, to reference the index, also called subscript. We have a flag, found it, we set to false. Okay, um, So there's some various variables going on here, as well as constants that we're going to use to say whether the item was found or not found. So you can look through those variables 
Um, this is in your uh, text, also in the examples folder for this week. But if you take a look at it, um, this right here, beginning on my line 22, is the beginning of a sentinel controlled loop. This is going to continue while the item number is not equal to 999. So um, recall any loop needs to test the loop control variable, which is item. This is controlling the loop. But it also should first uh, initialize that loop control variable. So notice before this loop starts, we guess, get the first item number from the user. So that's critical so that we have an item number to compare to 999. It also prevents us, um, you know, it catches the scenario where the user would type 999 the first time through. If they would do that, we should skip over all this logic and not, um, you know, be looking up prices or anything like that because they've indicated they're done. Notice also the last thing in this loop is to update that loop control variable. These lines are identical, pretty much identical to what we have up here. Okay, so that's very important. So what are we doing inside? Inside the loop, this part I'm going to highlight, is interested in searching through the array to see if the number that the user typed corresponds to an item in the valid items array. So we start by setting found it to false and subscript to zero because we're going to start searching the array at the beginning. And while that uh, subscript is less than the size of six, why six? Well, there's six elements, these are, uh, arrays are size six. While we're within bounds, we'll check and say, hey, is that item equal to the new element in the array that I'm examining? If it is set, found it to true. And we'll take one more step and say, look up the exact same position in the valid prices array to find out what the price is and set it to a price variable. We know that that's going to be used to output the value to the user. So we not only set found it, we, act, we were doing an additional lookup. Because they chose to use a do while loop here, um, it is in, instead of a for loop. It could have been a for loop. They used to do while. It is important to increment the subscript that will take it uh, first time through it was zero, this will increment it to one before we loop back around. So same kind of thing we've looked at in previous examples, just a little more uh, going on here. After the loop that searches, we have an if statement. It says if we found it, write the positive message, else output the negative message. Uh, the only difference here is we're just doing a little more as well. Uh, if we did find it, we also output the price. If we didn't find it, we increment the bad item count. The reason why we increment the bad item count is after everything is said and done and the user type 999 and we exit this loop, notice there's one more thing that happens that outputs what that bad item count was. So this one did a few extra steps, but notice all the underpinnings are similar to the earlier example. We have a loop that loops through and allows us to search the array here because we wanted the, allow the user to do multiple searches. We also had an outer loop that looped through and was able to collect multiple item numbers from the user.